Well, I told you it was going to be the winter revival tonight, didn't I? I warned you last night. I tried to get you guys ready for this, you know, but uh, you know what? I think it's plenty warm in here in the fellowships. Wonderful. Now, I know how to make it even warmer if you all just come to the middle section, you know, and there'll be like a campfire meeting right here in the middle of the auditorium, but you guys are fine where you are. I'm going to get you moving here in just a moment anyway. I've got something very unusual to do as we start this service. I want to express my appreciation to the pastor for allowing me to be a part of this ministry and to share this pulpit. You know, folks, when I do this in evangelist, I count it a great honor and privilege to be in another man's pulpit. I don't take that lightly at all because this is a sacred responsibility to protect this pulpit and to give me an opportunity to preach to his people, you know, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? It's an exciting uh, kind of scary at times thing, but I'm thankful for the privilege. You know, a lot of you folks have already asked, where are you going next? Well, I'm going to go see my mommy. Is there anything more important than that? Yeah, you know, tomorrow I'm going to Muncie, Indiana. That's where my mom is, and uh, I'm going to be, am I on here? I'm good, aren't I? I'm going to go there for a couple of days, and then I go up to Granger, Indiana, which is north of Elkhart, and do a uh, Friends Day thing with a church plan up there, and be excited to see how God's growing that church uh, they're in a new facility, as I mentioned earlier, but uh, just pray for me in the travels. Then on Monday, I get to go home, woo-hoo, and uh, go and go back to Greenville, South Carolina, smooch on my wife as much as she'll allow me to do. She doesn't like me to do that. She's glad when I travel. She, it makes for a happy marriage. Yeah, I'm going all the time. But uh, she's stuck with me, as I mentioned, for the whole next year because I'm going to be on voice rest for the next year or such, trying to repair this, this throat of mine. Now, with that in mind, I did try to sing this week, which I probably shouldn't have. It didn't help my throat. I went home in great pain that night, and I probably pained you trying to sing. But I did bring a couple of the CDs. I brought them out last night, put them on the welcome station area out there. And it tells you what's there and all that. There's a sacred CD, 12 songs I've written, and uh, hopefully it'll be an encouragement and blessing to you. Then there's a fun time CD with just goofy stuff that I've done in camps and couples retreats and stuff over the years. And that's out there for you to check out if you don't have them. If you care to do that, I think it'll be an encouragement and a blessing to your life. Well, let's grab a word of prayer, and, and I'm going to warm you up a little bit here in a minute. I'm not going to hug you, but we're going to have some action here in just a second. So let's bow our heads and hearts. Let's ask God to work in our midst, and let's just praise Him already for His goodness to us. Heavenly Father, we do thank You and praise You, Lord, for, for having a building. Lord, that we're not outside somewhere in a tent. Lord, at least we have some covering. We have some heat in the midst of this worship opportunity. But God, we're looking, looking for you to turn up the heat as far as conviction is concerned. And God, you will challenge our hearts. You will, God, bring forth a work that's needed from your perfect, all-knowing mind. So God, we love you. We thank you for this time of uh, study and reflection on the Word of God. God, help us to listen very carefully so we can again practice this in a faithful way. Lord, if there happens to be someone here tonight that needs to get saved, God, we just pray you'll save their soul this hour. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of having a church such as this. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I know some of you have worked hard all day, you're dead dog tired, and this may breed bitterness in your heart, but as you, as you know from the other messages, you need to put that outfit off, you know, and put on this right stuff in Christ Jesus, but I want you all to stand, would you please? Now, here's what we're going to do. Now, this may, this may be a bad idea, but I'm going to do it anyway, because you folks like the fellowship a lot. But what I want you to do, besides someone in your immediate family, or someone you know in a real personal way, I want you to go to someone and tell them your name. If you don't know their name, they don't know yours. Maybe tell them your middle name, even if they know you. Is anybody ashamed of their middle name so we can come to you first? Okay, all right, don't ask this guy right here. He doesn't want anyone to know, so go to him first. You know, and then once you introduce yourself, tell them what you do. You know, maybe you're retired, maybe you're a teacher, you, do, you work in a factory, you have a business or whatever you do. And then maybe about some of the habits habits and hobbies of life that you're involved with. Wouldn't that be a pretty easy assignment? So I'm going to unleash you. Okay, now don't just stay with one person. Grab some information. Go find someone else. But hey, I know this will be difficult for these people here. I want you to go to these carnal people over here. Okay, I want you to break the divide of separation. And I want you to go all over this auditorium and tell people what you do 
on a daily basis. Go, go right now. Don't leave. This is not an excuse to head out the back door. Don't be bashful. Shake some hands. Tell them who you are. Tell them what's going on in your life, where you work, you know, just normal stuff of everyday operation. If you go to school, tell them what your favorite subject is. There's a lady back here that needs some conversation. There she is. We got to keep them moving. Nobody's hiding from this. Come on, teenagers, get out there. Go find someone else. Brother Nathan, find somebody. Tell them about yourself. Tell them, come on, get a little conversation going. Switch, switch, find somebody else. Find somebody else. Get you another victim, another opportunity. Get, don't find just the easy ones. Find a visitor if you can find one. Tell them all about yourself. Get that guy back running the computers too. He needs to be known and, and renowned here. Find somebody else. Don't just stay there and, you know, get to know their whole life history, but just find someone else next and go to them and get some information. Hurry up. We're about done with this, so go find someone else real quick, and then we'll come back to our seats. Okay, okay. Wind it up. Come back to your seats. That's enough. Hello. Time out. Come on back to your seats, party's over. Go back to your seats. Don't sit down yet, I'm not done, I'm not done. All right, go back, just stay at your seat. Got another assignment here. Isn't it amazing how the guys are talking the most? Isn't this amazing, the jabber, jabber jaw and guys? All right, folks, come back to your seats here. Here's assignment number two. Did, hey, let me ask you this, did anybody learn something very unusual that needs to be shared with the whole congregation? Did anybody find out what his middle name is? What is it, brother? Go ahead and share it. We'll pray for you. What is it, brother? Lowell, that's a good name. If you're 97 years old, then, you know, it's, it's a great name to have. <laughs> Did you find out anything unusual about what somebody collected or the hobbies they're involved with? Did you find anything really weird? Anything strange? All right. Uh, sometimes it's amazing what we find out. Now, here's a, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? Because that's just what you do on a normal basis. Now, the next assignment is this. I want you to go to someone, not in your immediate family, not someone maybe in your close circle of fellowship, but now I want you to tell them what you do daily for the Lord. You know, not that you just read your Bible, not that you go to church all the time, not even that you love Jesus from head to toe, but what has God convicted your heart to do and be faithful with? You ready to do that one? That might not be so easy. There's some of you, I'd like to do that because I'm the most faithful servant of God. Oh, I'm so great. There you are. All right. Sit down. I'm not going to make you do that, okay? But you know what, folks? You should have just as much to say about that decision that you've committed to on what God has convicted and challenged you to be faithful to. God's not haphazard about His will for our lives to bring glory and honor for Him. Folks, this is very crucial that you get this, how important you are personally to fight the good fight of faith and do the ministry to reach souls and grow people up and fulfill faithfulness to the will and working of God. My question tonight for you is this, what has God put on your heart personally to do? Now, some folks don't even know that exists. So I'm going to give you the most familiar, blatant example of this. Get your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah tonight, would you please? Go to Nehemiah, and specifically to start out here, I want you to go to chapter 2, and then we'll get back to chapter 1. In chapter 2 and verse 12, here's what God did to a guy who is a layman. He's a government worker. Can God use government workers, people? Can they let go of the shovel long enough? Can they again be a part of activity instead of watching everybody else work? Oh, yes, God can even use lawyers and doctors and anybody else that will say, Lord, I want to be used of you. But let me show you specifically what God did in the life, heart, and testimony of this guy named Nehemiah. Go to chapter, uh, go to chapter 2 and go down with me to verse 12. Chapter 2 and verse 12. Nehemiah says, I arose in the night, I and some few men with me. Now here it is, underscore this. I have this in my Bible underscored. Neither told I any man what God had put on my heart to do. 
You know what? Nehemiah is no different than any of us. God very specifically through the Holy Spirit as you study the Word of God, as you're filled with the preaching of His words, He wants to give you directions. He wants you to set forth a plan to do what He's ordered up for your life since time has began, before you began. And again, God has a will, a work, a ministry for you personally to fulfill. Not guess, not baby, but no so stuff. Again, to go forward in faithfulness to accomplish much for him. Now, how did this come about in the life of Nehemiah? Folks, the same way it's going to come about in your life. I want to go back to chapter 1, if you would, please. And there are three things taking place here in a very obvious, no doubt way. First of all, he is burdened concerning the people and the work of God. Secondly, he's broken before God. He's saying, oh God. Something's got to be done. Something needs to take place through your power and working. And then we see him beseeching God in this passage. Here's how he got all stirred up. Look down with me in chapter 1 and verse 2. It says that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, how did Nehemiah respond? Well, that's too bad. Boy, somebody should pray for those people. Something needs to be done. You know, folks, it's amazing how nonchalant we are with the mess that Christianity's in today. How, how a wreck people are as far as their spiritual wall staying strong and firm to fight for Jesus and live a biblical life. What goes on in your heart when you see what a mess Christianity, Christianity is and how folks are not really doing faithfully what needs to be done for God? Let me show you what happened in Nehemiah's life. Look at the verses that follow. It says, it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. Boy, that's a novel idea, isn't it? a brokenness, a a broken heart. He said, wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And he said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth the covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine eyes now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. Now look at this, which I pray before thee now day and night. Now people look at me for a minute. When God's burden becomes your burden, it won't just be a passing thing. It won't be just a stirring up during revival meeting. No, it will consume, control, and direct your life. That's what God's after. That's what's going to take place when God puts his burden upon your heart personally. Then keep going with me. He doesn't just point the finger at the people around him. He also says, hey, I need to get fixed and right too. Look on down here. Let thine eyes be attentive and thy thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which look at this, we have sinned against thee. Both I and my fathers have sinned. Now, what was the big problem here? Well, look at verse seven. We have dealt very corruptly against thee. We have not kept thy commandments, and, and nor the statutes, nor the judgments which commandest thou thy servant Moses. He's saying we have not been faithful to you, God. We've not listened to what you so lovingly blessed us with as far as your truth, your instruction to help us honor you, and again, have a faithful, fulfilled life before a holy God. God, we need you. You know what, folks, if you come with that kind of tenderness, you come with that kind of brokenness and yieldness to God, I'm telling you what, you have yet to see what God can do in your heart, let alone set forth through that life, your life that belongs to him. Now, I'm going to give you an outline concerning this specific burden that God wants to place on an individual's heart. And folks, don't miss the ride that God's looking to take you on even here tonight. Here's point number one as far as the outline. When God places this kind of burden on your heart, it will show up in every aspect of your life. 
When God places this kind of burden in your life, it's going to show up in who and what you are. First of all, it's going to show up in your countenance. Now, go to chapter 2 again, would you please? And let's see how this unfolds through the testimony and presentation of life of old Nehemiah. Look down with me in chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 2. Showing up on your countenance. It says, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Now, folks, look up here. Why was he so afraid? Because you're supposed to be happy, happy, happy before the king, 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 or you're dead, dead, dead. Y'all with me? You know, you're supposed to help him have a good day whether you're having one or not. But, folks, what was going on? He was so convicted. He was so challenged. He was so burdened, it showed up on his life, and he didn't have to manufacture some hoop de do whatever. He was so, again, filled with the burden of God's working. And then look what happens next. It shows up in his desires. The king basically says, well, what do you need? What do you want? Well, let's keep reading. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And I said to the king, Let the king live forever. You know what that means in our modern day language? Hey, king, you the man. You, you the man. You, know, you see what he's doing here? He's hoping he's not going to have his gizzard slip. He said, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, hath, uh, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? And the king says, Well, what do you want me to do about this? Look at the next verse. And the king said unto me, For what dost thou make requests? So I no doubt, folks, he took a big old gulp. And he told him the burden and what God had put on his heart to do. Now, folks, are you catching on to this? He's, he's thinking this through. He's pondering the thoughts. He's planning it through his mind. And he's looking for an opportunity to proceed on in faithfulness to fulfill faithfully what God had burdened his heart to be and do. And again, folks, that's not just for old Nehemiah. That's the kind of personal burden, the personal conviction, the personal, again, drive God wants to park in your heart so you personally can fulfill what God has saved and called you to do for him. Now, the thing we need to understand here, you know, he's ready to go. I mean, the, the king kind of says, hey, I'll give you a couple Home Depot cards, you know, and, and maybe a Lowe's if needed. And Man, I'll even protect you, get some soldiers. We'll just kind of get it all done so you can go forward and do this work. But when you're coming back, and you know, and they did all this, you know, logistics of this, that, and the other, but now here we go and praise God for the opportunity of seeing God bring forth a great working. Why? Because one man's listening. One man's looking to be faithful, to again fulfill the burden that God had placed on the heart. Now, here's number two, and this is very, very important because the devil's going to try to kick your teeth in. Do you understand how much the devil hates this church? How much the devil hates you because you're not playing some entertainment church activity around the corner or around the bend, that you're looking to be a conservative, fundamental, Bible-believing, God-honoring person and actually not just know the Word of God, but live by faith that comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God? Do you realize the devil hates that? He doesn't care if you're religious. He doesn't care if you're busy with church activity. He just doesn't want you to know the book and live the Word of God and get a job done the way God orders it up through this book. You all understand how you are greatly hated by the devil and those that seek to score points for him. But here's an important point concerning that. When God put... Thank you, children. Thank you. I know you're excited about my message like I am. Somebody go duct tape those children. Duct tape them. Weren't they cute tonight? I tell you what, folks, if you folks sang as loud as they do, conviction, 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 how again filled this room would be with praise unto our God. I mean, talk about your bunch of, you got a bunch of hot dog kids. Are you with me here? I mean, you got, they were ready to do a little showbiz razzmatazz there, I think, and they wanted to take the whole program. You know, if you guys are nothing else in this church, you know what I've learned? You're a very fruitful group of people. A lot of kids, a lot of kids. Okay, here's the second point. When God puts this kind of burden in your heart, listen carefully, not everybody will share that burden. Let me do that one again. When you get lit, when you become committed, 
When you're looking to go forward instead of stagnate or go backwards in your life for Christ, there are a lot of folks going to be real uncomfortable because they don't want to live that much by faith. They don't want to have that kind of activity to really go and trust and obey and be bold for the cause of Christ and realize God is able, just like the kids saying tonight. So let me read this again. When God puts this kind of burden in your heart, not everybody will share that burden. You know what I've found everywhere I've ever been in Christianity? There are always bullies on the block. Have you noticed that? People that, again, will bring opposition, folks that will be filled with criticism. You know what I call this kind of person? Burden buster. You know, burden buster, somebody that just wants to have you as lazy and worthless and fruitless as they are. They want you to be so, again, non-active and not, again, going out boldly doing the work of God that all of us should be every day faithfully looking to be a part of. There will always be bullies on the block. Now, look with me in this passage. I want to go down to a couple of verses here. Go down to chapter 2 again. And I want to show you the response to these guys being opposed by the bullies on the block. And they're very obviously listed even in this passage here. If you go down with me, let's go down to verse, well, let me read verse 19 first. It says, but Sambalot, and it says Geshem, and, 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 and uh, I can't read this here, it's a little dark, for, and Geshem, it said they heard of this work of God, and it says in verse 19, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you will do? Will you rebel against the king? They're kind of mocking them going look at me look at folks Ooh, oh oh you're gonna get a party together and you're gonna come put a hurting on the king oh i'm a, oh it's and you know just mocking trying to belittle and discourage those who are simply looking to go forward to be faithful to god and i love the response of these guys look down at verse 20 and verse 20 it says then answered i them and said unto them the god of heaven he will prosper us. Would you underscore that? Because, folks, he's just as able to do that today. The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, underscore this too, will arise and we're going to get the job done. We will build. Now, folks, as this burden in Nehemiah's heart starts spreading the lives and hearts of others like a California wildfire, you know, the opposition starts backing off, right? And they said, well, this just, we just better back off and let, no, 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 no. The devil came on even harder. More opposition came from the ungodly crowd. And I want to show you this in the passage. Go to chapter 4. In chapter 4, more criticism, more opposition. In chapter 4 and verse 1, it says these guys, they were wroth. They, they were just, again, in a point of great anger and looking to demonstrate and present that anger. Then it goes down in verse, if you look down in uh, verse 7, it says they were very wroth. It says they took, again, great indignation against these people of God who were just doing what? Trying to do work for God. Trying to be faithful to what God had ordered up. But these guys, they don't get it because they don't have it. They don't have that kind of relationship with God that we take so for granted. But folks, I'm telling you, God wants to light everybody up. He wants all of us to have more faith than less faith. He wants us to have the song on our minds and hearts every day. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but trust and obey. Folks, don't you think God is sick and tired of people who are hearers but not doers of the Word of God? Now, don't you get frustrated with that, the people you work with, if you're some factory or some organization, and people sit around and you do all the work? Mom, do you get a little tired of that with your husband? Please, no testimonies. You know, where you're doing all the work and everybody else just sitting and watching you do it. Don't you like it when folks like to get involved and many hands make work a lot lighter? How about the cause of Christ? Shouldn't, if anything, stir us up to do more instead of less? Should be to please and honor God and do whatever he allows us to be a part of. Do you still get it? This is a privilege and it shouldn't be a pain. Do you understand this isn't something you should run from, but run to and look to have not less but more? When you really understand that the God of heaven, the creator of all, saves us. He wants to use us. And he says, I will use you if you'll just let me put a burden in your heart. Direct your life to do specific responsibilities of faithfulness to again do the work that I've saved and called you to be faithful to. Now again, 
the, the, the response of, again, these guys coming on after them. Again, they're even coming to the point. If you look down at verse 8, they're, they're planning some battles here. Look down at verse 8. And they conspired all of them together and came to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder what? Hinder the work of God. Circle the next word of verse 9. Nevertheless, in spite of the criticism, in spite of the opposition, how, how big and bad they meet. Nevertheless, we made our prayers unto our God. You know, their focus was on God, not the enemy. Isn't that where we get tripped up? They focused on what God can do, not what man is just never going to be able to do in and of himself. So, folks, it's a whole perspective we choose to have in our spiritual lives. Yeah, man can't, but I can do all things through Christ. You know, I'm not able, but God is able to even carry me through. Look at verse 14. That's where it gives us that perspective. If you look on down here in this passage, it says, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Let me read that again. It's right in the middle of the verse. Be not afraid of man, of what they say or what they can even do. Remember God. And then goes down in verse 20, and he shows that they understand, hey, the, that he understands the battles of the Lord. He says in verse 20, our God shall fight for us. Folks, has God gotten out of that taking up the banner and fighting faithfully on our behalf? Is that quit? Is God any less powerful than what he was even for the people that chose to be faithful at this point? No, folks, he's still got enough to go around. And he can still clean anybody's clock whose clock needs to be clean. But your God will provide. Your God will protect. We just need to proceed in faithfulness and again, believe God will do what only God can do. Now, if the devil can hinder us one way, you know what he's going to do, don't you? He's going to come in another door. If he can't discourage you with the heating going out of the system, he's going to try to irritate you some other way. Now, in chapter 5, I'm not going to take time to go through this, but there was a very unusual thing happening in chapter 5. What was going on? Christians were cheating Christians. Hmm, hmm. You think that happens today? Yeah, where Christians aren't responding in a way a Christian should respond. But folks, then the devil tries something else in chapter 6, and that's where I'm going to park. Turn there, if you would, please, for a minute. In chapter 6, the devil tries diplomacy. He tries diplomacy. If you look down with me in this passage, it's very telling. We'll start reading in verse 2. It says, Then Sambalot and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages of the plain of Ono. But look at this. They thought to do me mischief. Now, folks, here's what I thought when I read that. How does he know that? How does he know these guys are not looking to help but hinder the work of God? It only comes one way, people, through the discernment that God gives to a person. See, folks, more than any time I've been in Christianity, you need to pray for discernment. I need to pray for discernment, and you do too. Because there's so much information available that it's overload city. And you can find people as brain-dead and clueless as you are if you want to find someone brain-dead and clueless. You can find someone rebellious who is all in the name of Jesus setting forth so-called truth. But, folks, you need to pray God will help you rightly divide the word of truth. That God will give you discernment like Nehemiah to know the good guys from the bad guys so you can do right and not do wrong. And folks, there are a lot of bad guys out there in the name of serving and honoring God. But there's some even, I'd say, a bit more threatening and more violent as far as against the will of God that just hate your God and are nowhere close to living a life that honors and glorifies God. you got to stay away, but understand who those people are. So what happens, he says, hey, we need to get together. It's kind of like a ministerial assassination or something here. But in verse 3, he says, I sent unto them saying, hey, guys, I'm doing a great work, so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after the sword, and I answered them after the same manner. Now, folks, as you continue on in this ministry, folks, don't stop. Can I tell you, don't even slow down. 
Let's press toward the mark, the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't let the flesh fake you out or distract you from going forth in a bold manner to do even more for the cause of Jesus Christ. Folks, it was fun for me to drive by the old building. <laughs> it, just, it just kind of tickled me. You know, what a great place to start it up. But you know what? As God grows and matures this church and lets you take even the next step, you're going to look back and go, boy, God's been so good, hadn't he? God has just been so faithful in honoring our right choices of proceeding on boldly and faithfully for him. And folks, God's going to do that. Now, I understand there's a fine line between faith and stupidity. You all with me here? You want to be discerning. You want to be directed by the handed power of God. But don't let your flesh hinder what God is trying to do. But here's bottom line. Bottom line of what anybody should have as far as a representation of a local church. Look on with me further in chapter, uh, chapter 6 and verse 16. Let me read you this verse. It says, so the wall was finished, and now what did the people see? What was the testimony of God's people? I love the last phrase. For they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Isn't that what you want? You know, pastor, I know him well enough. He doesn't want to say, I'm the greatest pastor of all times. You know, this church wouldn't be anything without me. No, folks, you know what? He's just merely a submissive, yielded servant that God will use in a great way as long as he stays a yielded, submissive servant. And it's no different from you in the congregation. The only thing God wants of us is just simply this, God, I'm going to be a surrendered, submissive servant. And God, I don't care if I don't think I can handle this. I'm going to trust you and be faithful nonetheless. I don't care, God, if my flesh is fearful and weak. I'm going to trust you and go forth in boldness. And God, when everything's settled and set forth, I want people to say this of our church. This has got to be of God. Boy, I know those people over there. There's no way they could do what has taken place in this place they've called out to worship and honor God, that God's called out. And again, folks, here's the statement of testimony. They perceived that the work was wrought of our God. Only God could have done this, and the song we should sing continually, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Now, one of the favorite verses, and I, I left this out on purpose, one of the favorite verses of every pastor I know is found in chapter 4 and verse 6. Would you go back a few pages? I left this out on purpose before I want to take you to the closing point here. In chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, so, we, so built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together into the half thereof. For Here's how it happened. For the people had a mind to work. Can I have an amen, please? You know, in... <laughs> You have a business, I've had a business, we're all a part of different organizations and stuff. Secular or sacred folks, look at me. I've never known anything to get done unless people aren't willing to be there to get it done. Is that too simple? You know, how can more be done when people have a mind to work? When people again say, hey, I'm a volunteer for Jesus? When people don't sit at home and again expect everybody else to do that which God has called and saved them to do? But isn't that happening today? Are we more concerned to consume with the things of the world and again fulfilling the desires of our flesh than really saying, God, what do you want of me? And you don't have that burden. That's why you don't have that track record of faithful, yielded, sacrificial servant to the will and working of God. Now, I want to show you what happens after the physical stuff's taken care of. As even Nate referred to when we had prayer earlier today, he really referred to this situation. Go with me to chapter 8 next, would you please? Now, again, the walls, they're all built and everything's ready to go. And now what happens? Now spiritual repair. Now they bring out the Word of God. Look at chapter 8 with me, if you would please. And let's go down to verse 9. It says, they all gather together, they have the pulpit set, they're ready for proclamation of the Word of God, and when it was presented, how did God's people respond? I just love this statement. For all the people wept when they heard the Word of the law. Folks, don't you wish Christians today had that kind of tenderness? That kind of wow concerning the wonderful Word of God? 
You know how lacking and wow we are? Sometimes between Sunday and Sunday, we don't even know where our Bibles are. You know, from Sunday to Sunday, we never crack even the pages of the Word of God. We'll read the, you know, the paper, or we'll again read that periodical. Or for you Fox News junkies, you'll be on there like 24-7 hearing the same thing 5,000 times. You know it's true. But folks, listen to me. What's going to help you the most? If you have that burden, what's going to deepen that burden? If you have that deep burden, what's going to continually stir you up in freshness to fight the fight and finish the course and be fruitful and faithful to God? It's when you really are wowed. You're really absorbed. You're really just overwhelmed with the wonderful Word of God. And the Word of God you hide in your heart to bring victory over your flesh and again a stirring to your soul to accomplish much for the glory and honor of God. Now here's the direction and the challenge to you personally. One person, a layman, a government worker, just one, broken, burdened, and beseeching God. When he took that action of humility before a holy God said, oh God, we've messed up and you need to fix what's broken. God, fill our minds with your truth. God, direct us in your will. And then he said, okay, God, here am I. Use me. And God placed a specific burden that led to a specific opportunity, which again turned to great praise and honor to God and impacted many hearts for all eternity. Do you understand God wants to do that even through you? Oh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I haven't got much education or, you know, I'm not a real good talker. Isn't it amazing how your flesh automatically, without much even effort, goes to Excuseville? Y'all with me? Where you again justify you staying unfaithful. And the main problem is just this. God's burden is not your burden. If it was on your heart, you get up off your stool of do nothing. You would go forth in boldness without apology, whether anybody else does it or not, to do what God has placed on your heart to do. Let me give you one of my favorite examples of one of my best friends of all time. You know these harvest rallies? I think Pastor said they have them now in Mansfield. They started in Connersville, Indiana. There was this guy named Dave Buck. Dave Buck, he, he always called himself a dumb old farmer, you know, but he's one of the smartest, godliest guys I've ever been around in my life, one of the dearest friends. Well, what happened, Dave Buck was so burdened for the teenagers in the Connorsville area. So he said, God, I don't have much, but what I have, I want to give for your work. So what he did, he cleared out one of his uh, barns and started with the youth rally. You know what happened? They grew the next year almost doubled, if not more so. They got up to 300 or so. Then they said, well, we're going to have to do something else about this. So they got this big, humongous tent. Folks, I emceed those things for like 25 years. There were, a, there were times when we'd have 2,000 plus people under that tent, kids getting saved, lives surrendered to the ministry and a phenomenal work for God. And then you know what happens? Michigan says, hey, we want to do one of these. Bob Jones says, hey, bring the tent down here. You know, and then Kansas City does one. We took the tent down into Mexico and thousands of people, thousands of people were saved. We're impacted for all eternity because one big, dumb old farmer said, you know, I don't have much, but what I have, God, I want to use for you. I don't know what God has entrusted unto you, but I do know this, he wants to use it for him. You may be amazing in your management mindset on how to manage the work and will of God to a greater, more impacting way. You may be phenomenal with your hands, you girls, you may be the cooks of cooks, but you didn't really bring me anything this week. I'm kind of hurt. But you know, you may have so many, again, gifts and talents and wherewithal that you, if you simply allowed God to direct you, could do more than you ever imagined to impact hearts and lives for all eternity. But see, if, if you don't come convinced you're vital, that you're important, that God says, I saved you and called you personally to do the work that I've had established for all eternity. God wants to use you. But I'm telling you, it will never happen unless you open your heart, 
You yield your life and you cry out with all you know how to cry out, oh God, please, I want your burden to be my burden. Would you bow your heads and hearts, please? Heads bowed and eyes closed.